This is Paul Burnett interviewing Dr. Alex King for the mining project of the business series. It's October 13th, 2014, and this is tape three. Uh, so Dr. King, we were talking about the different categories of work being conducted mm -hmm. at the um, Critical Materials Institute. Um, and uh, you talked about the first three that were in part proposed by the DOE in a 2011 report. And you and your team added a fourth category, uh, which is uh, in line, more in line with what the, the DOE, uh, with what the Ames Lab has always done, which is basic scientific research. Can you talk about how that fourth dimension uh, helps the other three categories and the kind of work that's being done? Yeah, so we refer to it as cross-cutting research, which um, it's a nice catch-all term. I guess everybody uses it. Uh, but in our case, it's kind of um, fundamental research on demand. Um, so when, a, when one of our technical focus areas, the first three focus areas, is working on something, that trying to find a way to extract rare earths from phosphate processing or something, um, almost always you, you run into a case where we don't understand how this ion or this ligand works in solution. We don't have all the details of the, um, the, the thermodynamics of solution of that phase, how it's affected by other things that are put in the solution. Um, we just really need some basic thermodynamic models or basic thermodynamic data. So we have a... Um, a thermodynamics, what we refer to as a thermodynamics team, which is actually a couple of different projects. One is aqueous thermodynamics, and another is um, melt or you know just pure metal alloy thermodynamics. Um, and these guys are really, really good uh, at determining thermodynamic data from computer models, and also um, in terms of confirming those models with well-performed, thorough experimental validations. So we have a team that can make measurements, make predictions, and go back and forth and find data very quickly. We can provide phase diagrams where they're not in the ASM handbook, um, which is you know the first resource you always turn to. Um, we can check the accuracy of what's in the ASM handbook. Again, by computation using uh, off-the-shelf software like CalFAD, enhanced to deal with things like magnetic phases, which behave a little differently. Um, but we also have the capability to do um, uh, experimental determinations of phase diagrams using what are called combinatoric methods, meaning you make, make arrays of um, specimens of different composition uh, which can be done very rapidly in thin film form. Um, you can make a, a silicon wafer with uh, composition gradients across it and then test different points on it for different properties. Mm -hmm. That doesn't help with magnets, so we have developed a, um, a tool that allows us to make little Mini -magnets. micro <laughs> magnets. They're, they're a few millimeters mm -hmm. of controlled composition and we'll make maybe a thousand of them on a plate. Mm. And we can take those to a, um, a facility at Stanford Synchrotron Radiation Lab where we can measure the composition, the structure, um, we can measure the magnetic properties, and we can do all that while we change the temperature up from room temperature to about 1100 Celsius. So we, we can simulate processing mm. and measure phase diagrams as a function of composition and temperature. Mm. So anything where we need basic compositional data, thermodynamic data, we have a team that does all of that. Mm. Um, within the same area, we have a team that is working on some very fundamental aspects of the electron structures of rare earth elements, particularly in the environment of a magnet or a phosphor. Um, so the thing that characterizes the lanthanides or the rare earths is they have what's called 4F electrons. Mm. Uh, the 4F shell goes from having no electrons in it to, have, to being full as you cross the lanthanide series. 
The 4F electrons behave weirdly. They are not the outermost shell of electrons. They are one in from the outermost shell. And nobody has really paid much attention to physically modeling on a thorough quantum mechanical basis how those electrons really behave, mm -hmm. and particularly how they behave in the presence of atoms surrounding them. So we have a team that works on that, and that helps us to predict magnetic properties. And once you can predict magnetic properties, you can maybe invent materials that mimic them, mm -hmm. things like that. Mm -hmm. um, you also need that information for determining how um, rare earths bond to other chemicals, and that goes into um, developing separations agents. So there's a lot of basic, very basic science that goes into some of the work in focus area one, two, and to some extent, focus area three. So it sounds like, a, and you mentioned outsourcing to the synchrotron, mm -hmm. at the uh, at Slack. Stanford, yep. um, and synchrotrons, synchrotrons and cyclotrons are useful for material science. Um, could you talk about cooperation with, because it's not just one site where this is, work is done. Right. Can you talk about the, the kind of structure of the CMI and, and who does what where? And uh, yeah. Well, so, maybe <laughs> not, not in well, too much not detail. Not in too much detail, but yeah. <laughs> CMI is a consortium. It's, um, uh, it's headquartered by the Ames Lab, and I direct it. And I, my office, when I'm, I'm there, is in Ames, Iowa. But um, we have a fairly large footprint of research being done at Ames, some being done at Oak Ridge National Lab, Lawrence Livermore National Lab, Idaho National Lab, uh, a good bit being done at the Colorado School of Mines, half a dozen other universities, and I hesitate to start listing them because I'll forget one and, <laughs> and therefore offend somebody, right. um, and uh, seven or so corporations, soon to be a lot more corporations. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's, it's very spread out. And in, in every focus area, in every project, we draw on the strengths where the strengths really are. So we don't try and, because people are close together, we don't try and get everybody to do what they need to do. Mm -hmm. We say, okay, if you really need that quantum mechanical calculation, we have somebody at Ames who can do it, or somebody at Livermore who can do it. Which one's the best? That's the person who will do it. Right. So always pick the best person for the job, mm -hmm. um, and make sure you define the job right to start with, because otherwise mm -hmm. nothing works. Um, so we're spread out. We're, we're diversified um, in terms of location and expertise. Uh, and and in, some in some sense, that's a strength. And in others, it's a great challenge because, you know, you can't just walk down the hall to the, you know, the guy you're collaborating with and say, hey, you know, I, I did this on the back of an envelope. Did it make sense to you? Mm -hmm. um, but we do have fairly sophisticated video conferencing to link up our sites. And, um, mm -hmm. uh, and people are beginning to get used to using that instead of email. Yeah. Um, that's a culture shift. Well, that time and again, people talk about um, you know cultures of innovation. The story over and over and over again is the importance of place yep. to research and to innovation. That uh, whether it's the famed Chicago School of Economics mm -hmm. hanging around the elevator, that's where yep. all of the innovations happened. Sure. Uh, to uh, other other instances where. Uh, scientists congregated in a certain place, and, and so you can talk a little bit about that. Right. So when Stephen Chu was the Secretary of Energy, he came up with this idea of these energy innovation hubs, and he said it, it should be modeled after you know the Bell Labs in its right. heyday. And he had worked at Bell Labs, so you know you didn't want to argue with him about <laughs> that. Um, and the idea was, uh, and in, in one description of it, you know, really well-funded research groups, lots of expertise of different kinds, all working in the same place, and in, in one version of it, eating in the same cafeteria. Mm -hmm. And the, apparently, you know, Chicago um, Economics Department, it's the elevator lobby, and Bell Labs, it revolves around food. So it's, <laughs> um, I guess the cafeteria was good. We do not have a cafeteria. Mm. Um, we do not often gather together. We do have a phenomenal number of conference calls, video conferences, and stuff going on every week. Mm. Um, 
but we still have managed to be very innovative. We have, um, we will probably by the end of this week announce our 20th invention disclosure. Hmm. That's in 15 months of actual operation. Mm -hmm. And um, it's hard to attribute that to any one thing. But there are a number of things that, that have contributed to it. One is that um, very early on, after about three months, we went to you know, DOE is constantly saying, well, what have you done? What have you done? What have you done? And we keep telling them, well, you know, we all got to work on time this morning. <laughs> Minor achievements like that that used to count for something. <laughs> well, after three months, we said, well, we've got three invention disclosures. How's that? That's pretty impressive and only three months' work. And then after six months, we had six. And so that someone said, well, you're going at one a month. And the word went back to, um, to our researchers that DOE really liked us having invention disclosures. Mm. And it went the other way from DOE apparently reported to Congress in some way, shape, or form that these guys are really producing a lot of invention disclosures. And then the next thing I know, I get getting calls from people in the um, Senate Appropriations Committee saying, tell me something about all these inventions you've made. So positive feedback counts. Yeah. Uh, you know, let's be absolutely clear about that. When people are told what you're doing is really important, it, you're on the right track, people respond. Yeah. Now. Yes, you can produce endless numbers of invention disclosures if you want to, mm -hmm. right? It's very easy. Mm -hmm. um, but we're not writing trivial invention disclosures. Always, we're trying not to. The way we're getting a lot of invention disclosures, it, the, the big trick we have found is finding out what our industrial partners really, really want. Mm -hmm. And the, the, um, it's not that hard. What, the way most researchers think inventions go is, look, I have this great idea. I work on it in the lab. I do a little bit of modeling and theory and try and make some in the lab, make some measurements. If the measurements don't, I don't work, I go back to the theory, revise that, go around that cycle, and then eventually I've got something that works. Then I take it to industry and I say, hey, look, isn't this great? And they say, yeah, <laughs> not going to use it, but it's cool. Um, we work the other way. We listen to what industry wants mm -hmm. and then go backwards and say, okay, how would we meet that need? And if we can't meet that need, well, what basic science do we need? And that's, that goes back to our fourth focus area. Mm -hmm. um, but it's always directed to a specific need. And what we found is that when we start our projects, We've been trying to road map them. So, you know, okay, if you want to develop this, you need to, whatever this might be, mm -hmm. you know you're going to spend some time doing theoretical modeling, maybe more, maybe less, depending on the project. You're going to have a few candidate materials, and at some point you're going to down select. So you say, okay, in the road map, this is a decision point, critical decision has to be made here. Um, maybe nothing works and then we cut off that project, it's gone. Um, but what we've found is that knowing when your critical decisions are being made is really, really important because the industry that needs that material is working in the, sort of another plane and they're developing a product and they're making critical decisions about, okay, what material are we going to make this product from? And they're going to make that critical decision at this point in their roadmap. If you're not ready with your material when they make that decision, you might as well sort of be inventing and then throwing it over the wall and seeing what it'll take. But if you are cognizant of when they will make their decision, and if you can present a solution ahead of that decision, then you are in the innovation business. Mm -hmm. If you're just inventing stuff and throwing it over the wall, um, that's great, but that's what they call the valley of death. Um, and we prefer um, you know, the roadmap of life. So you, you, know, you kind of follow your roadmap 
to where there's a bridge across the valley of death instead of reaching the fence. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And you know, road mapping our projects is really, really, really important. Mm -hmm. And so part of our economic analysis group is actually devoted to the road mapping of the, re of the research mm -hmm. and constantly reviewing the road maps, making sure we're on the road map, maybe making sure we're not straying off it, and making sure that our road map matches the industry roadmaps. Right. Well, it sounds like it's not just mapping. It's also flagging and signaling. So you are, mm -hmm. you are communicating with outside partners? Or, yeah. Or is it more uh, industry-wide in the sense that th those who stand to benefit from this technology are aware and, you, right. and they're following you? Yeah. So we take input wherever we can get it. But we get the most from our existing partners who have all signed a massive non-disclosure agreement with us and are therefore comfortable with sharing information that they might not want to share beyond the, um, the group. So the quality of information goes up as you get closer to people. Right. But still, even without that, you know, um, uh, when we were writing our proposal, I spent lots and lots of time just going and talking to people in the industry saying, what's your biggest fear in terms of material supply chain? Mm -hmm. And listening to what they had to say. Um, at, at our annual meeting, which took place a few weeks ago, we've, where we actually gather everybody on site and they can all talk to, to each other and decide what they're going to do next, hopefully. Um, we had a great meeting, but one of the things I did was laid out what I had observed of the way the group works. Um, and it, it's sort of a set of, you know, what they, in industry or in corporate culture, they call the corporate value statement. Um, I just, I hesitate to use those terms, but it's things that we have started doing by no, by no design, just by instinct or by because of the, who the group of people is. But the first thing on my list, I think there's seven or eight value statements or you know, this is how we work statements. First thing is we listen. Mm -hmm. And if you don't listen, um, yeah, you can do great research and it will maybe have a one in a thousand chance of generating actual product one day, but if you listen to what industry really wants, and if industry listens to what their clients really want, mm -hmm. then you have a chance of producing something that's of value. Mm -hmm. So all of the 20 or so invention disclosures we have so far are responses to requests that industry has come to us with. Mm -hmm. They're not things that we have just gone out there and said, hey, isn't this cool? Um, they're all responses, and that, that's the biggest single issue. And by definition, that means that they're not just idle disclosures where you could just say, we discovered something, but it was a discovery that is a response to a need that was identified. Yeah, and in some cases, it's close enough to what the industry wants, or you know, in some cases they say, yeah, I know we said that, but times change. Right. Um, and, and, and that's okay, mm -hmm. because Times do change, and you have to be agile. But the, you know, if there's any one thing we have discovered you know, from an innovation perspective, it's the value of listening. Mm -hmm. So, um, well, I want to ask one follow-up question um, with respect to uh, the non-disclosure agreements. Um, intellectual property. Mm -hmm. um, there's an increasing trend of, of industry university partnerships, including yep. public universities. And there's right. all kinds of, there's an office of technology policy for every university and they work out all kinds of materials transfer oh, arrangements. Yes. Do you have those kinds of, so if there's non-disclosure, how does that work when this becomes a product? Right. So yeah, we have a master non-disclosure agreement, an intellectual property management plan, and everybody who comes into the, um, the Critical Materials Institute as any kind of a partner has to sign those plans. And it took forever for the lawyers of the first set of partners to agree them. Seven industries, four national labs, seven universities, 
Lord knows how many lawyers. Shakespeare had it right. And he said, first, <laughs> kill all the lawyers. Um, we'll, we'll edit that one. Yeah, out. all right, Or sure. attribute it solely to Shakespeare. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, the, the lawyers all think, uh, uh, you know, they're all there to protect the interests of their clients. And the problem is that there, there's a little bit more bias toward protecting the interests of the clients than promoting the, um, the progress of the science. So we've had very long discussions with lawyers. And then in the middle of this somewhere, you know, some lawyer uh, leaves a, uh, an office and gets replaced by somebody else. And basically, you start all over again mm. because every lawyer looks at every contract slightly differently. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, there's one company I would dearly love to bring into CMI, and their lawyers are absolutely opposed to one clause in our uh, management plan that every other company has signed on to. Um, we're not going to go back and renegotiate it with every other company. Mm. So it's it's kind of reached the point of a, it's take it or leave it, guys. If mm -hmm. you really want to be part of us, you can be part of us. If you just want to talk to us on a non protected basis, mm -hmm. we still want to talk to you. But. Right, right. Um, and uh, during that process, did you make a, um, what kind of case for science did you make um, in saying, because, you know, uh, in the past, sociologists mm -hmm. of science have said, you know, this is how science works, and it's, uh, there's like com co uh, communalism or communism, yep. where there has to be a free flow of information for it to work at all. Right. And that's, if you want that level of innovation, that's what you have to buy in. Did you make a case for a certain kind of transparency and openness, or? We didn't have a hard time making that case. I mean, it, it, it's, it's sort of out there. Everybody knows that if you want science to proceed, there has to be a, a free flow of information at some stage. The harder part was actually not having free flow of information within the group, it's how do you protect the information once it's in the wild inside the group? How do you keep it from, you know, we've got 250 researchers you know, fully or partly on payroll. Mm -hmm. And they're also engaged in research on other things. And some of them work at the Ames lab and they report to me, but the vast majority report to somebody else in some other institution. Mm -hmm. How do I discipline that group and prevent them from letting the information that they learn through CMI leak into a partnership they may have with some other project that they're working on outside of CMI. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the, the contentious issues were not how do we encourage free flow, but how do we put fences around it? Mm -hmm. um, how do we you know, set up a, a hard disk drive that our researchers can access, but nobody else can? Mm -hmm. And how do we manage that? So, lots of challenges. Yeah. 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 And for the seven industry partners uh, so far, um, it's just uh, information. It's it's conversations, or is there investment? Some of them are investing significant sums. We're actually paying at least one of them to do some of the research. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, GE has a wonderful research facility mm -hmm. um, in upstate New York. And um, we're paying them to do some research that we need to get done. Mm -hmm. And if, and Frank, you know, the deal is, if we use federal funds to pay for that research, then the results are all in the public domain. Mm -hmm. So it's, okay, so GE gets to see where it's headed before everybody else, obviously. Right. Um, but once it's done, it's done, and it's out there, and anybody else can license it. Right, right. Um, so a couple of questions about, um, this is at the national level, and there's, these are global companies. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, the, the cooperation and coordination is part of the Trilateral Critical Materials mm -hmm. Institute. Um, could you talk about what's happening in those other countries and, and how the work is coordinated or whether it's coordinated? Yeah, okay, so, so th this is where, you know, if you think it's hard to build a, uh, you know, 
a $25 million a year thing with, um, what is it, 17 or 18 partners and 250 researchers. Just try getting two nations to talk to each other. Um, but early on, in uh, after the onset of the so-called critical materials crisis, um, there, was, there were some fairly informal meetings at, um, governmental administrative type of level uh, between Japan, US, and the European Union saying, you know, this is a, a global problem. It affects everybody. What can we do to um, uh, collaboratively to help? And there was an informal meeting in, um, in California way back that was followed by, it's been basically an annual meeting. Um, we just, actually the Ames Lab hosted the last one, the uh, first week of September. Um, so the first one was in Washington, DC. Second one was in Tokyo. Third one was in Brussels. And the fourth one was in Ames, Iowa. And so, that's an interesting sort of location. But what it actually reflects is that in Washington, it was you know very high levels of government, um, you know, not elected officials, but administration officials came together and talked about, okay, this is the set of problems that we see in the US, and this is the set of problems that the Europeans see, and this is the set the Japanese see and we're all listening to each other. Mm -hmm. um, when it got to Japan, it was a little bit more, okay, where are the overlaps? Mm -hmm. And we're still kind of talking at each other. Mm -hmm. When we got to Brussels a bit more than a year ago, um, there was a sense of, okay, we see the overlaps, where can we come together and collaborate? And when we got together in Ames uh, a month ago, it was, okay, how do we get these people working together now? Mm -hmm. And there are interesting challenges. I mean, um, and, and then there are observers come in every now and again. So the Canadians and the Australians have been invited, South Africans on one meeting. Um, there's an interesting diversity of, of needs. Japan is entirely a user nation. Mm -hmm. They have no resources of rare earths. They get their resources from elsewhere in the world, but they are a great manufacturing nation, mm -hmm. and they use a lot of the world's re rare earth resources in building things that we all love to have. Um, Europe has virtually no rare earth sources. Um, there's a small mine in Russia that feeds a, uh, a refining plant in Estonia. Um, yeah, maybe some of that goes into Europe. But Europe is also manufacturing intensive, but it's a different kind of manufacturing. Mm -hmm. In you know, Japan, they make a lot of things that use magnets. In Europe, they make a lot of things that use um, uh, light sensors and light emitters. Mm -hmm. The US is interesting because it's both a rare earth producer and also a manufacturer using rare earths. Australia is a rare earth producer, not much of a manufacturer, frankly. Um, Canada is hoping to be a rare earth producer, mm -hmm. um, less so a manufacturer. Mm -hmm. So there's all these differing interests. Um, the places where we share um, mutual concerns, are in the tracking of the flow of materials. So um, what we call materials flow analysis. Mm -hmm. Who knows where all the rare earth is coming from, where it's going to, you know, can we tell how much is flowing into a particular nation, how much is flowing out of that nation? Are they stockpiling the rest or are they just wasting it? What's going on? Um, so all this, these are important questions. And because there's no open market for rare earths, all trades are basically, you know, I call up a, a supplier and I'll make an offer and they say, nah, you need to give me 10% more, 10%, you know. Um, mm. But it's all done 
in the dark, as it were. Mm. So it's hard to track trading. Mm. Um, so there's a lot of effort in that area. Um, in the U, uh, you know, in CMI, we believe that we have a great deal to learn from the Japanese in terms of recycling technologies. So we're we're working with them to learn more, and we're trying to help out because after you recycle, you have to separate. We have good separations science. Um, with the EU, they have um, some great downstream recycling capabilities. So that. Um, Probably the separate the post recycling separation of metals is done better by a couple of European companies than anywhere else. So we're trying to get engaged with them to help us out on that. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of magnets, we are collaborating with the Japanese, and um, the uh, so the development of alternative materials, better understanding, better processing of magnets, both. The U.S. and Japan are collaborating very closely together. Mm -hmm. So a lot of bilateral kind of things have, have come out of this. Mm -hmm. Very few truly trilateral um, agendas, except the data collection side of it. Mm -hmm. so okay. These are the things we're doing. So you know, it, it's taken a long time. Um, you know, first establishing that there's a political will to collaborate, mm -hmm. determining what each other can do, what our strengths and weaknesses are. Um, what we're willing to share with other com countries, what we're not willing to share, um, what our, you know, and, and it's like building the, the company collaborations we have already, but at, a, at the next highest level up. Okay, if I collaborate with Japan, how do I know that information isn't going to be diffused to some other places that we don't want it to go? Right, right. Um, so, uh, one of the things that is now running its way through Congress, if it hasn't already done so, is the Critical Minerals Policy Act. Yep. And that is supposed to, how does that impact your work or the CMI's work at all, if at all? Uh, so actually, the, there have been several acts proposed in both the House and the Senate. Um, and some of them don't affect me at all. Uh, some of them affect us quite profoundly, and there's one in the House right now, which is the one I think you refer to, which actually um, contains within its language what's called an authorization of the Critical Materials Institute. Um, and this this gets into the workings of Washington pretty deeply. So usually a federal program is authorized by a committee, like in this case, the Space Science and Technology Committee. But an authorization says, this is something that Congress would like to do. It doesn't happen unless there is an appropriation for it. So appropriations committees, so authorization say, this is what we want to do. Appropriations committee says, yeah, yeah, maybe, First. well, all this, yeah, this one we'll do. Right. You know, we'll provide funds for. Right. The Critical Materials Institute didn't work quite that way. We were appropriated. The funds were given to the Department of Energy to create CMI, but it was never authorized. Hmm. And, you, you know, you don't have to have an authorization to have an appropriation. But if you have an authorization, then, you know, and that actually the authorization describes all the things the Critical Materials Institute is supposed to be doing, mm -hmm. um, then those activities appear in the federal budget, whether or not um, the president or the, or the executive branch put them in its budget request. Mm -hmm. So they get in the debate, mm -hmm. and the Appropriations Committee acts on them or not. depends. Mm -hmm. But. Um, one of the nice things that the appropriation does, or the authorization does, is it lasts beyond the current funding appropriation mm -hmm. for CMI. So it gives us a little bit more um, extension of life, if you like. Mm -hmm. um, so that bit I like. Right. Uh, you know, there are other things in there in the in the bill that have no impact on me directly. Mm -hmm. They deal with things like. Um, uh, speeding up the um, approval process 
for permitting a mine, mm -hmm. for example. And one of the big challenges with starting up a new mine is the length of time it takes to get permits issued because all the time that you spend doing that, you know, a startup company trying to open a mine is burning through cash. Mm -hmm. And you can only get so much cash invested. If you burn through it all while you're still trying to get permits, then you're never going to open a mine. Mm -hmm. So speeding up the permitting process, consistent with checking that all of the right actions have been taken, that the environment's been protected, that the financing hasn't been laundered. All those things are important. But um, not letting it sit on somebody's desk six months just because it says you should act in six months. You know. mm -hmm. um, right. Those things are important. Right. Um, th there's other things in there about maintaining a list of critical materials. Um, my only concern with that is that when the government maintains a list, it tends to be slow to change. Mm -hmm. um, the process needs to be agile because as we've seen, you know, uh, materials become critical or not so critical in a very short time frame. And if the government list says, you know, these are the critical materials and that's cast in stone for five years, mm -hmm. uh, if we have a crisis in two years and something, you know, I have to deal with material X or Y and I go to the government and say, I'm working on X, Y, and they say, but it's not on the list. You can't mm -hmm. do that. Mm -hmm. That's, mm -hmm. you know, right. potentially a problem. I don't think that will happen. Right. I've certainly addressed those concerns with the committee, um, and they say, no, that's not the intention. So, you know, what's your intention is good, but the language in the law is what will be interpreted you know, when the people who wrote it have mm -hmm. gone away. So you have to be very careful what's written into laws. Mm -hmm. Well, is, is the, in, the, in the fourth category of the work that's done in CMI, the, the subset of that is the, is the economic analysis. Yep. Does that or could that potentially serve as a kind of economic intelligence unit for, for oh. the development of new material, yes. material supply chains? Absolutely. And, yeah. So one of the things we're trying to do is provide a bit more foresight on what materials are likely to be critical. We, wouldn't, we don't call it forecasting mm -hmm. because nobody can do that. Mm -hmm. or, if, or if I could, I wouldn't be selling it to the government. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be selling it where I could make much more money on that. Right. Um, but we, we get questions from industry every now and again of the flavor of, look, we're thinking of introducing a product that contains X amount of element Y. And we think the market for this is so many units per year. What do you think that would do to the material supply chain? And in some cases, it's, well, you know, that's hardly a blip on the supply chain for that material. In other cases, it is you know, that will significantly perturb the market in that material. You could cause a um, a, a disruption in the market. If speculation follows disruption, then prices can go up. So we, we, we don't say this will happen, but we provide scenario modeling. Mm -hmm. And I think that that has tremendous value and provides some interesting guidance to companies that, that come to us with those questions. Mm -hmm. And presumably to the government as well, to make them yeah. aware of what, what right. could be of course. happening. Um, so in, in this interview, we've talked about so many different domains, mm -hmm. so many different areas of expertise. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the learning curve for Dr. King and how, you know, what you expected when you started and how things have turned out so far? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think, so we are, the fifth energy innovation hub that DOE created. And you know, this was a great experiment on the part of Stephen Chu. Um, and I, I sometimes tell people we are the fifth of four because there are four left now. One other one was, um, uh, was dismantled because it wasn't performing as an energy innovation hub. Um, and 
the, the leadership issues that led to the demise of the energy efficient buildings hub. Um, and it's, it's still there at a much reduced level, still trying to um, invent new ways to make buildings more efficient, but it's no longer considered a, an energy innovation hub. So I, I spent a lot of time talking with the other hub directors about what's worked for them, what hasn't worked for them. Um, but the, perhaps the better source of information was the DOE managers of those hubs mm -hmm. because it's relatively easy for me to listen to what the DOE, those DOE managers say about the other hubs and hear what they really mean. It's very hard for a hub director to hear what his manager says and not see it in a context that mm -hmm. kind of fogs or distorts the message. Mm -hmm. So coming in as the last of the five hubs, I could see how messages get distorted between managers and directors. Um, and so one of the things I set out to do is establish a very open uh, line of communication with our DOE managers, and not just the immediate manager, who I have is great, mm -hmm. but two, three, four layers up um, the, uh, the structure in DOE. And I've had um, great interactions with those guys. I can pick up the phone and talk to them at any time. They pick up, they don't hesitate to pick up the phone and tell me what they need from me. Um, but having that, ha having them trust me to deliver what they want and um, having me able to trust them and understand what they're trying, because you know, they never quite say exactly what they mean. Um, but being able to interpret what they mean has been very important. Having been a, a national lab director before I was a hub director, and none of the other hub directors have had that experience, uh -huh. but having been a national lab director first um, was really an important uh, learning experience. Mm -hmm. So it got me a long way up that learning curve mm -hmm. before we started. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.